if we are trying to win a game, we can search for dominating strategies. Strategies that are so good that they always win regardless of how our opponent plays. Whether this is a recreational game or a real life scenario that we are modeling using the mathematical field of game theory, trying to search out and find these dominating strategies is often the first thing that we do in our analysis. But how do we find dominating strategies? And how do we even know if a particular game has a dominating strategy? Well, that's what we're gonna be investigating in this video. My thanks once again to Brilliant for sponsoring this playlist on game theory. More about them at the end of the video. To illustrate this idea of a dominating strategy, let me begin with two pretty trivial games and then we'll move on to some more interesting ones. So let's actually start with a game that doesn't have a dominating strategy, namely Rock, Paper, and Scissors. Rock, Paper, Scissors is such a great game for deciding who has to do a chore and who doesn't have to do it because there is no dominating strategy. That is, neither of rock, paper, or scissors is actually any better than someone who's just playing completely randomly. If you knew how your opponent was going to play, if you knew they were gonna play rock, then you could beat that particular opponent with playing paper. But if they're just gonna be playing completely randomly, there's no dominating strategies. Okay, now let's see another game that actually does have a dominating strategy. I'm gonna give you two options. In option A, I could just give you 100 bucks. Seems pretty nice. But in option B, well, what we're gonna do is we're going to flip a coin. If the coin becomes heads, then you're gonna get the $100. But if the coin is tails, you get nothing. So what should you choose, option A or option B? Well, well, option A, of course. For option A, you always get the $100. For option B, you only get the $100 50% of the time. There's a sense in which option A completely dominates, is just better than option B. And so the nomenclature that we use here is that option A is the dominating strategy and option B is the dominated strategy. It's dominated by option A. Technically, we actually call this scenario weakly dominated because there's the possibility of having an equality between the two. You could, you could get $100 either way. If it was say 100 versus 90, then the 100 would be called strictly dominating. Okay, now let's do a slightly more interesting example. I want you to imagine that I've got two firms, firm one and firm two. And these two firms are both deciding whether they want to do an advertising campaign. So they both have two options. They could either advertise or not advertise. And what I'm gonna do is put those choices of advertising or not advertising together into what we have talked about previously in this series as a payoff matrix. If you want to know more about how normal form games like this can be represented with a payoff matrix, well, check out the previous episode in the Game Theory playlist down in the description. But basically the idea is that in this payoff matrix, it captures how much payoffs does each of the two companies get in the different scenarios. For example, in the not not scenario, that's where both of them don't advertise, firm one, the yellow, gets 16 units of profit, and firm two, in the blue, gets only 12 units of profit. Now what we're gonna do is analyze this normal form game, but I just want to note that this type of normal form game comes about from, you know, some somewhat realistic assumptions. I've put all these assumptions down here. They don't matter all that much for the purpose of the video, but I just want to note that, for example, the not not category represents the fact that firm one in yellow is bigger than firm two. That's why it's like a 16-12 split. And then the way I got the rest of the numbers was for the two scenarios where one advertises and the other doesn't, I assume that when you advertise, you get 75% of the market share, I mean, just an assumption, but that advertising costs you $8. So 75% of the total 28 is 21, 21 minus the eight units is just going to be 13. And so that's why the one who advertises gets 13 units and the other one gets the remainder of seven. And then finally, I'm gonna assume that if they both were to advertise, gonna cost them both eight units and they take the 28, they split it up 14, 14, it's 50, 50 if they both advertise, but you subtract off the eight from each and you get to six, six. Regardless, a bunch of quasi realistic assumptions for an economic scenario that lead to this particular matrix. But now we get to the key part. How should I play this game? What should firm one do? What should firm two do? So to try and figure this out, we're going to analyze whether either firm has any dominating strategies. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna think about this from firm one's perspective. I'm only gonna look at the yellow numbers, the first numbers in every cell, because those are the numbers that are relevant to firm one. Now, if firm two, if I knew that firm two did not advertise, that would just say I was in this first column. 
But if I'm looking at this through the lens of Firm 1, it's a pretty easy decision. If they don't advertise, they'd make 16 units. If they did advertise, they'd make 13. 16 is bigger than 13 last time I checked. So they should not advertise. However, if Firm 2 instead had advertised, if they told us that we were advertising, we were thinking from the perspective of Firm 1, well, it's the same basic story. 7 is bigger than 6. They should not advertise. So basically, the arrows go the same way. And this leads us to the conclusion that not advertising is a dominating strategy. It is always better for Firm 1 to not advertise, regardless of what Firm 2 does. The exact amount of money they make does change based on what Firm 2 does. But it's always more money if they're going to not advertise than if they do advertise, under the assumptions of this payoff matrix. Okay, so we know there's a dominating strategy for Firm 1. What about for Firm 2? Well, this is not so simple, because if you look at the blue numbers, the second numbers, the numbers associated with now Firm 2, the arrows actually go in opposite directions. That is, if you knew that Firm 1 had not advertised, Firm 2 should advertise, 13 is bigger than 12. In contrast, if you knew that Firm 1 did advertise, so you're on the bottom, 7 is bigger than 6, and so Firm 2 should not advertise. So there is not a dominating strategy for Firm 2, the way there was a dominating strategy for Firm 1. So you might think, okay, we don't know what to do as, as Firm number 2, but in fact we can do more because we can put these two facts together. Because we know what Firm 1 is going to do. Firm 1 is going to not advertise. We already decided that. Not advertising was a dominating strategy for Firm 1. So we don't even have to consider the bottom row. And now if we think about it from Firm 2's perspective, how should they play? Well, they prefer 13 than 12. They would prefer to advertise. And so as a result of this, given that Firm 1 will not advertise, now we know that Firm 2, that they will advertise. And so we know the sort of final answer of how this is going to play. Firm 1 is going to play not advertised, Firm 2 is going to play advertised, and the final results, the final payoff is going to be 7 units to Firm 1 and 13 units to Firm 2. So this is how you can use the idea of a dominating strategy to try to figure out how people are going to play. And it's kind of weird, it's kind of interesting that the initial asymmetry, which is that Firm 1 was bigger, that if they didn't advertise at all, Firm 1 would do better off and get the 16 versus the 12, has led to the reverse situation when you add in the advertising. It's now Firm 2 that has this big incentive to do the advertising, and they actually end up with more profit. They end up with more profit of 13 than Firm 1 7. But there's nothing that Firm 1 can do about this, because if they start advertising, they're going to go down from 7 to 6. So they are still nevertheless better to not advertise. And this basic idea gets to some larger principles in economics, where when you have a particular firm in a competitive marketplace, even when one firm is a market leader, there's these kind of incentive structures that allow other firms to do advertising blitzes or come out with slightly new products that get some sort of a market advantage, and then all of a second, this second firms are doing well as well. This is exactly the kind of scenario that we get to see when we model it with game theory. Let's do one more example, an even more complicated example, and I'm not even going to try to associate this with any real world scenario, it's just some game. We're just going to study it using the idea of successive analysis of a dominating strategy. Basically, there's two players, there's the yellow and the blue, player one and player two, and each of them have three options. Player one can play A, B, C, player two can play D, E, or F. But which should they play? Now, if you want to pause the video, you can analyze for yourself and try to see, does any of these players have any dominating or dominated strategies? So I encourage you to pause and try to figure that yourself. But if you're just here to enjoy the show, well, I want to focus specifically on option B, where player one plays B. So from player one's perspective, you have these three different numbers, two, one, and minus one, depending on the choice for player two. But notice that these are always worse. If player two plays D, then 2 is less than 4 and 3, and so B would be bad. Likewise for E and F, in every single spot, player 1 should not play row B. And so basically row B is a dominated strategy, and player 1 is just not going to play it. So we can just simplify our lives by just graying out that entire row and just ignoring it. And that's about as far as I can go for player 1 right now, because A and C, sometimes they're better, sometimes they're worse. And none is clearly dominating or dominated. But now, let's think about the second player. And indeed, I want to focus on the choices that happen when they play F. 
If player one plays A, then the best outcome for player two is playing F. They get three opposed to one or two. Likewise, if player one plays C, the best option for player two is still to play F. The one is better than the minus one and the zero. And now playing F is a dominating strategy. It's better than playing D or E in either the case of whether player one plays A and C. Either way, the arrows mean that we should be playing F before player number two. So now we know something else. Player two will play F. So we can simplify again. They're not gonna play D, they're not gonna play E. We can just gray out all of that. That leaves just two squares as to the possible outcome for this game. And now let's go back to player one. From player one's perspective, they're just trying to decide, is zero better or is one better? Well, one is better, and so player one now is going to play C. So the final outcome to this game is that player one is gonna play C and player two is gonna play F and then they're both gonna get one unit of payoff. Now, I do want to note one kind of funky thing. If you look at this payoff matrix, you'll notice that there's actually better squares for some of the players. Like for example, the one where player one plays B and player two plays D, this is gonna give you two five as payoff, which is way bigger than one one. So both players would be happier going for that, going for the 2-5 than they are for the 1-1. One, one. Unfortunately, it's just not quite so simple. Because if you knew that they were both going for the 2-5, if you knew that that was going to be a result, then player one would say, well, hold on, I want to switch. I'm going to, I don't want to play this B, I want to play A, which for me is better. And then that would say, okay, well now we're going to move up to the 4-1. And then player two is going to say, well, hold on, I don't want the 1, I want the 3, I'm going to play F. And they would keep on going back and forth. And the key difference here is that there's a certain sense of stability. When you make this choice of C and F, neither player can move unilaterally to improve themselves. And as a result, this method of eliminating these dominating strategies is gonna to lead to a certain type of equilibrium. And exactly what that means is gonna be the subject of the next video in this series where we start talking finally about the idea of a Nash equilibrium. Anyone that's been watching my videos for a while knows that I am a huge fan of active learning. And that's why I'm so thankful that this video is being sponsored once again by Brilliant. Because the lessons and courses that you can find on brilliant.org really put active learning first. But what exactly do I mean by this? Well, take for example the idea of juggling. I mean, you can go onto YouTube and watch a ton of videos of people juggling. And you can learn from that. You can develop because you're learning different juggling patterns and skills and, and ways just to be better than what I am. But you have to do more than that. You have to spend a lot of time actually juggling. And it's just like in math. You have to spend a lot of time actually doing math and wrestling with problems. And that is best done when you have a wonderful and supportive environment. One course I've been enjoying recently is called Algorithm Fundamentals, which has never been a strength of mine mathematically. So it's been kind of fun to play around. And as you can see, there's a large number of different topics, but perhaps the one that we'll click on to see is understanding big O notation. What I like about these lessons is that they deliver the content in these nice little bite-sized chunks. I'll, I'll let you go through it yourself if you choose to. But in between all of these bite-sized chunks of delivering content, there's a large amount of opportunities for active learning and self-assessment. For example, I have a little quiz here. I have to decide what is the big O notation of this thing. I believe it's N squared. And indeed that's correct. I have the nice graphic that illustrates the idea. I can show an explanation if I'm confused, and then I can move on directly to the next topic. This is how Brilliant is incorporating active learning at a very fundamental level into the design of their courses. I think it's excellent. So definitely go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazet. The link is down in the description and sign up for free. And also the first 200 people that go to that link are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. All right, with that said and done, please do give the video a like for the YouTube algorithm. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.